to. As an illustration of eagle formation, we might remember certain processes in a frog's egg. At a given stage, a gray spot is produced on one side of a frog's egg. Experiments prove that this gray spot layer develops into the head. If you cut into this with a thread, a double-headed frog will be produced. If you remove it, the frog will have no head. Thus, you can prove experimentally that the gray spot in the frog's head is that part of the plasma which later develops into the head. If you remove the spot and then drop a little hydrofluoric acid onto the plasma, a gray spot will grow. The correct plasma will be formed, a new head will grow, and the whole frog will batch out. This process is similar to ego formation. The ego would be the center of the field of consciousness formed in it, but produced by a total reaction of the whole psychic system, which is a self-regulating system. You can say that the latent impulse to produce the ego is expressed by the image of the mythological hero. He has qualities which do not coincide with the actual ego, but have more to do with the archetype of the total psyche. Most human difficulties, including neuronic and psychotic dissociations, are linked with an ego that is not functioning in accordance with the total disposition of the psyche. There is a kind of disharmony between it and the makeup of the psyche. In a certain type of schizophrenia, there is an enormous fantasy production in the unconscious and an impoverishment in consciousness of either thinking or, as Eugene Bleuler pointed out, of emotion and affect. The conscious personality is in disharmony with the wealth of the vitality of the unconscious. The overflow of the unconscious falls into too narrow a vessel. One of the main tasks of therapeutic treatment, therefore, is to try to enrich the range of emotional reactions so that the vessel is larger and more solid and can receive the emotional impulses from the unconscious. But there are various forms of disharmony. Not every neurotic split is due to this cause, though it is a frequent form of dissociation. Especially the ego complex tends to dissociate from the rest of the psyche and to get out of harmony with it. It tends to act autonomously. Therefore, one of the most essential problems of the human race is to build an ego which functions in a healthy manner, that is, in accordance with the instinctive makeup of the total anthropos. On the one hand, we are distinguished from the other animals by having a strong ego complex, and on the other, our greater consciousness presents us with the danger of a split. The mythological tales in which hero or heroine behave in a specific way express an unconscious attempt to produce an ideally functioning model ego complex. The hero represents the ideal ego complex in accordance with the requirements of the psyche. He is the one who cures the sterility of a country and restores collective health through a flow of life in a healthy form. Every tale has a different meaning, with the model hero functioning in accordance with his instincts. When the heroine functions in accordance with the instinctive requirements of the psyche, she is the pattern of the conscious feminine personality. It is a kind of model of an archetypal connection of ego and self, which has to be filled out by actual realization in each person's life. You could say the totality, or what we call the self, is a dormant, inherent possibility. It is like an egg, a mass of possibilities that needs actual conscious life with its tragedies, conflicts, and solutions to bring the totality into reality. Thus the ego is the instrument by which psychological potentialities can become real. For instance, if I am of an artistic disposition, but my ego never discovers it, and does not do something about it by trying to use those possibilities, it might just as well not exist. Obviously, therefore, the ego is the instrument of realization of all the different psychological, inborn dispositions of the human being. Expressed mythologically, the ego is the instrument of incarnation for the self. The hero and heroine in fairy tales illustrate the way in which such an instrument of incarnation must function. The ego has an infinite number of different functions to fulfill, and every tale emphasizes one aspect, generally the one which is at that time lacking or needed in the collective situation. A striking example would be the Sun Godhead. The central religious god of our civilization is a helpless man hung on the cross. He is condemned to suffering and complete passivity, and that is what the very active self-willed Western man worships and prays to. 
what he needs to meditate upon. There is, however, another problem. There is an infinite range of the symbols of the self, for instance, a golden ball or a treasure which must be found by the hero. If we jump to the conclusion that these are symbols of the self, such an interpretation might fit a dream, but it is not a mythological interpretation. For example, you cannot say that one symbol of the self finds another. Technically it is true, but it does not make sense. We must differentiate our interpretation and ask what would be the difference between the symbol of the self, such as a golden egg or ball, and the hero or heroine who also represents an aspect of the self. The simplest statement would be that the hero is a human being and the ball is not, which is banal enough but has to be taken on the right level. In some material the totality appears in certain impersonal symbols, a tree for instance, and sometimes in a half human personification that is, the hero. What is the difference? One aspect, the ball, is that of a material symbolization of the self, that is a symbol which refers to the totality of the psyche in an impersonal way which tends to turn up in moments of dissociation and disorientation. When one feels lost in a chaotic situation, as far as I have seen, especially when the ego tends to take its miseries, complexes, and involvements too personally, a material abstract symbol has generally the effect of objectifying the existence and of achieving a detachment which at times is badly needed. If someone thinks he or she is the only person who ever had an unhappy love affair, then life has to be seen in a less personal perspective. In other cases, when the symbol of the self appear, personified as human beings, they contain a hint of the required personal attitude. A certain type of human reaction is needed to meet the situation. It is not sufficient to be detached or philosophical. A specific human attitude is required. Our fairy tale, the Sleeping Beauty or Briar Rose, belongs to the pattern of the daughter goddess disappearing, in our story, in a death-like sleep. In the Demeter Kor myth, Kor, with her bridegroom, the god of death disappears temporarily, fading out of life and then returning again in a spring-like reawakening of nature. This pattern of the divine girl who disappears and reappears is paralleled on the masculine side. There is a divine son who disappears into the underworld and is brought back in spring, like Tamanus and Adonis. This is a universal theme. There is also a daughter goddess who disappears in this way, who mutatis mutandis has the same meaning. This type of core, the maiden, is closely linked up with the archetypal mother figure. In our story, the girl is blessed by a certain number of mother figures and cursed by one of them. She is blessed and cursed at the same time. In the Kor myth, Kor's disappearance is not directly connected to the mother, Demeter. The latter has a changing double aspect, standing for fertility, for help in childbirth, and for the grain and corn, but when she has lost her daughter, she becomes the goddess of revenge and sorrow. Demeter changes from one aspect to the other, depending on her relationship to the daughter. In the antique tale, Amor and Psyche, the girl goddess is badly persecuted by her future mother-in-law, the goddess Venus, characterized as a great mother figure. Like Ishtar in Otter Gatis, here we have an interesting variation, for Venus persecutes out of jealousy because Psyche is said to be more beautiful, as in Snow White. People worship the girl Psyche instead of the mother Venus. Psyche is thought to be an incarnation of Venus, but because Venus resents the existence of a living human incarnation of herself, she persecutes her. This is an interesting development in Western and Mediterranean civilization. A mother goddess produces a more human incarnation, a daughter figure to whom she has a very ambivalent attitude. It is a vague parallel to the same tendency in the famous story of the love affair of Aeneas and Dido. Dido is a goddess since she bears the name of a Phoenician goddess. But in the Aeneid, she is a human queen. Venus and Juno decide that Aeneas should love her. They arrange the affair and then Zeus and Olympus decided with them that Aeneas should leave Dido, who then committed suicide. This famous and impressive tragedy shows the ambivalent attitude of the gods in the collective unconscious toward a more human personification. This seems to be still a present day problem. 
Erskine wrote a book, The Lonely Venus, in which he too discusses it. Venus is the mother goddess acting in accordance with her effects and emotions without much reflection, and so getting into a mess, then recognizing that the goal would be to become human. The same tendency that took place in the religious system of the late Roman Empire has taken place in Christianity. This is borne out in the Judeo-Christian tradition by an ambivalent god-father figure who produces a son, not a mythological divine son, but a human being with a historical reality. So the incarnation of the father and the son has taken place as a tremendous religious collective experience. The same tendency can be seen in the development of the antique mother goddess who wants to incarnate in a human daughter, but the impulse remained abortive. It has nowhere been carried through and become a religious event. The cult of the mother goddess got stuck and suppressed and then reappeared later in the cult of the Virgin Mary, but with great mental reservation and precautions for disinfection of her dark aspect. She was once more admitted, but only insofar as the church fathers approved and if she behaved. The dark aspect of the antique mother goddess has not yet reappeared in our civilization, which must leave a question mark in our minds, because naturally something is lacking. If we study the antique mother goddesses who disliked their human figures of incarnation, we see that the conflict may be characterized in the following way. The mother goddesses depict absolutely unreflecting femininity. They simply personify elemental, emotional feminine reactions. If their husbands had a love affair with another woman, they made a terrible scene like Hera. We women must admit that without the break of consciousness we should do the same, for that is the elemental reaction. The mother goddess always behaved like that, but at the same time she behaved with charity. Everything poor, lamed, and unhappy was taken on her lap and loved and nursed. Elemental unchecked charity is typical for a mother goddess. Sexual behavior, as in Baobo, is absolutely natural. The mother herself was the great whore who gave herself to every unknown man she met. There was infinite fertility and generosity, unstinted charity, infinite jealousy and vanity and so on. All these goddesses are characterized by the total reaction which is in every woman for it is a part of her natural emotional and instinctual nature. If you compare the daughter goddesses with these mother goddesses, according to Greek mythology, they are identical with the mother, just as the son is with the father. Usually though, there are a little more human that is capable, as Psyche was, of sacrifice and of not simply following an impulse, of the ability to fulfill the task and not to show charity to the beggar man in the underworld, of restraining themselves from helping the dying and the poor and of judgment, which meant being more reflective and restricted and human, more formed and less primitive and chaotic in reaction, but more human and steadfast. This progressive tendency within the pattern of the feminine life appears in the collective unconscious in an effort to produce a new form of femininity in woman, and also a new model of eros in man, a more balanced attitude. Man in our civilization is ahead of woman in the civilizing process. In South India, the humanizing of women and of Eros seems to be ahead of the West. There, women are proud of their femininity, and there is a more differentiated attitude to Eros. In the West, there is a toughness, a vulgarity, and lack of differentiation of the Eros level, and far greater logos differentiation than in the East. The king and queen in our fairy tale had no children, but the frog says to the queen, Your wish shall be fulfilled. Before a year passes, you shall have a daughter. Before the birth of the hero or heroine, there is often such a long period of sterility, and then the child is born supernaturally. Put into psychological language, we know that before a time of outstanding activity in the unconscious, there is a tendency toward a long period of complete passivity. It is, for instance, a normal condition in the creative personality that before some new piece of work in art or a scientific idea breaks through, people usually pass through a period of listlessness and depression and waiting. Life is stale. If one analyzes them, one sees that the energy is meanwhile accumulating in the unconscious. I remember a time when I felt desperate in this way. 
Then I dreamed that I was looking at a big railway station where shunting was going on, and new trains were being composed. The dream showed that the energy in the unconscious was readjusting itself. Energy and instinctive patterns were rearranging. Before the outburst of a psychotic interval, there's also such a time when everything becomes stale, but then comes the explosion. Libido has been accumulating in the unconscious and comes out in a destructive explosion. So these periods of sterility mean that something specific is in preparation in the unconscious. Here it is foretold by the frog. The frog sits in the queen's bath. The Freudians would certainly have something to say about that. In folklore, the frog is looked upon as a rather unchaste animal. It was used in olden days in love charms in which its bones had to be worn in a certain form. It appeared at the beginning of many prescription having to do with fertility, sexuality, and bisexual love. One thinks of it as the male member fertilizing the queen, but if you read folklore, you find that it is a maternal animal used to help a woman at childbirth and to bring fertility. In many countries, the croaking of frogs in springtime is said to resemble the cries of unborn children and therefore represents the soul of the not yet incarnate child. In many countries, the frog is believed to be poisonous and is called a witch's animal. This is borne out by Hildegard of Bingen, a medieval mystic and learned writer, who says that especially in spring when everything is so beautiful, the devil likes to put frightful ideas into the heads of human beings. The devil likes the croaking of frogs. Here again is a connection with sexuality, sexual desire, or spring mood, a mood of exuberance in nature. Naturally, from a Christian standpoint, the frog can only be attributed to the witch and the devil. But it has also to do with birth of children and the ending of a stage of psychological sterility. It indicates a spirit of nature or a vital impulse. Jung has said of the frog that it looks like an attempt by nature to form man on the level of the cold-blooded animal. Because of the striking similarity to the human structure with the little feet and hands, this idea that the frog is an imperfect human being is very widespread. People call a child a little frog. The frog is a cold-blooded creature, not yet a human being, and therefore represents, especially in dreams, an unconscious impulse that has a definite tendency to become conscious. There are impulses which resist consciousness. You have to push them back, so to speak. The complexes themselves, if left alone, would remain unconscious. But sometimes there are complexes which have a strong energetic drive toward consciousness. They force realization of their existence upon people. The frog represents such an impulse, that which imposes itself upon you. So it is only a question of acceptance in consciousness and a realization of the content. If an analyzand dreams of a frog, I know that I must only have a receptive attitude, and that then the rest will follow by itself. In many other tales, a magic figure says that something must be done or eaten, and then you will get a child. But here nothing is required. It is a natural process. The queen has only to wait and perhaps knit some little things for it. So a little girl is born who is very beautiful. Then there is a big party for the baptism of the child where something terrible happens. Fairy godmothers turn up in a certain number, either seven or eight or twelve or thirteen, or six and seven, or two and three, but always one is forgotten or left out, who then curses the child. So we come to the motif of the forgotten godmother. Sometimes she is not invited because there are not enough golden plates. Sometimes because she had retired for 50 years to a tower where she lived alone and people had forgotten her. She had lived too introverted a life, or she may have been forgotten without any reason but then she turns up without further ado and has to be given a different plate, which she takes as a personal insult. So she curses the newborn child. This motif of the forgotten god or goddess, more frequently the goddess, is an archetypal one. When Agamemnon wanted to leave for Troy, there was no wind to take the ship across. It was discovered that Artemis was angry and demanded the sacrifice of Ephigenia so that Agamemnon had to sacrifice his own daughter to get across the sea. Artemis was wrathful at being left out, a typical motif of the hurt goddess, since it is usually the female who resents being ignored. 
but I must admit that there is also sometimes a male god who revenges himself if he has not been included in receiving sacrifices. This reminds me of a story at a children's party. A little girl ran crying to her mother. The little boys are punching my bottom. The boys were duly scolded, but then she came crying. I'd rather be pinched than not looked at. What does this mean psychologically? It is obvious that gods represent archetypal contents in the unconscious, or collective complexes. Normal complexes which everybody has, not pathological complexes. As Jung says, complexes are normal in our society, for example, ego and shadow complexes. They are different dynamic factors in the psyche which belong to the normal structure of man and which are generally personified in gods. You see this best in the astrological gods. Mars equals aggressivity and self-defense, Venus equals sex and so on. Each god represents a specific pattern of behavior. If a god or goddess has been neglected, it means that a specific natural psychological way of behaving has been omitted. It has either intentionally or stupidly been left out of consideration. Especially in early childhood, a new tendency first coming to life appears exaggerated for a time. Then in the course of time, it forms a part of the general functioning. For instance, some children can, for a time, only play with a dog or a train. They have phases where they are completely absorbed in one particular thing, which is then suddenly dropped for something new. This behavior strikes us sometimes as rather obsessive. There is always some new craze. In a boy it may be fighting or climbing trees, but it represents the awakening of a new element of consciousness, which throws the whole balance a little bit off. The awakening of sexuality is one of the strongest of the phases. Usually at such a time it swamps and dissociates the personality until it reaches its normal level. So complexes are not harmonious in human beings. They can fight each other, and may even push aside other instinctive drives. If a god is forgotten, it means that some aspect of collective consciousness are so much in the foreground that others are ignored to a great extent. The archetype of the mother goddess has suffered that fate in our civilization. For the development of western civilization, it was perhaps necessary for the western mind to have to ignore the mother goddess for a certain length of time and to put the whole emphasis onto male development. But ignored organs of the psyche behave the same way as ignored organs of the body. If you eat irregularly, your stomach is upset. Our physical organs need a certain amount of attention. We cannot afford to ignore their needs by one-sidedness. And the same is true for the organs of the psyche. If we ignore certain vital nuclei in the psyche, they will cause an illness in the system just as a stomach trouble can result in complete destruction of health, so can one complex that does not function properly disorganize the whole. Then there is a neurosis or worse, and one has to find out what has been ignored and is now cursing the whole personality. That is a very optimistic interpretation because indirectly it says that if one were always to behave rightly and sacrifice to all the gods, then nothing could happen to us and we would all be psychologically healthy. The different variations of fairy tales, however, do not quite confirm this. In some of them, the godmother turns up just because she likes to cause trouble. Sometimes the outbreak of a neurosis is a just-so story. It would be wrong to say that it was brought about by guilt. Sometimes it's due to one-sided behavior. But one must also reckon that nature can be spontaneously deficient. The gods sometimes create trouble. It's not always just man. In nature herself, there are deficiencies, incompletenesses, and disharmonies. In a French version, the bad godmother is called a miserere, the goddess of misery. Something which is nobody's fault falls upon people, and one cannot accuse anyone of moral deficiency. This has happened to many of us, for we have been brought up with the idea of a benevolent godhead. If evil comes, it is our fault, or that of old Adam. The fault lies in some human being, but you can just as well say that the guilt lies with God, an idea that is not obvious to us, though it is to some other civilizations. God may get into a terribly bad mood, which then falls on mankind. It is important to keep this in mind to balance the Christian view with that of the immorality of nature. 
If the myth tells the story in a different version as does ours, then some uncertainty exists about the problem. Why does Briar Rose come under such a terrible curse? One version says that it is a just so story, and the other version has that a goddess was angry because she had been ignored. There may have been real uncertainty about the problem. It is like the modern theory of light. One theory has it that light is made up of particles, the other that is waves. It would seem that if one is true, the other could not be. Similarly, either neurosis is caused through some transgression and cured by an ethical change of attitude or it is bad luck caused by nature and changed by good luck. Each view excludes the other, yet apparently both are true. One should see the double aspect and treat the neurosis from both sides, even though the aspect radically contradicts the other. The mother goddess who has been ignored appears as a personification of hurt feelings, vanity, and resentment. She is the personification of feelings that have turned sour, milk which has turned sour, and that, I think, throws light on a problem that has a lot to do with the problem of women. It is why I have chosen this fairy tale for my discussion on feminine psychology. The source of evil and of things going wrong in women's lives is often a failure to deal with and to get over hurt feelings. For hurt feelings open the door to anonymous attacks. The source of things going wrong and of evil in women in a tremendous number of cases is that archetypal reaction of not getting over a hurt or resentment or a bad mood through being disappointed in the feeling realm and then being overpowered by the animus. Suddenly one is in an upset or possessed mood. It is very helpful to ask, where have I been disappointed or hurt in my feelings and have not sufficiently noticed it? Then you will frequently find the cause. If you can get back to the origin of the hurt where you have not worked it out, an animus possession will stop, for that is where it jumped in. And that is why in animus possession there is always an undertone of the reproachful hurt woman. Anima's possession in a woman annoys men madly. They go up in the air at once. But what really gets the man's goat is this undertone of lamenting reproachfulness. Men who know a little more about this know that 85% of anima's possession in women is a disguised appeal for love, although unfortunately it has the wrong effect since it chases away the very love that is wanted. Underneath the animus, there is a feeling of reproach and at the same time of wanting to get back at the one who has hurt you. It is a vicious cycle, and arguing develops into a typical animus scene. Thus, the ignored femininity which plays up in a woman's anger is something archetypal. Naturally, women who have a negative mother complex are those most liable to this form of reaction, since they are in such a need of warmth and attention which they have not adequately received from the mother. Here I must refer to C.G. Jung's paper, Psychological Aspects of the Mother Archetype, where you find a much more detailed description of the different aspects of the mother complex in women. This paper is the basis of my lecture. Women who have not been properly attended to by their mothers tend to be especially touchy and constantly feel ignored. If one has sufficient self-esteem, one need not be hurt. If a man ignores a woman who is sure of herself, if he runs after another woman in her presence, she only thinks he has bad taste. She is so sure of herself that it does not annoy her. But if she has insufficient self-esteem, the abyss of hurt feeling and resentment wells up. A woman with a negative mother complex is always threatened with the resentful, hurt feelings that keep welling up on every occasion when a man does not agree with her, or if another woman steps on her corns. Her greatest task is to overcome her resentful anger. Such a woman will nurse a hurt for years, put it in a drawer and bring it out again and again. She follows the archetypal pattern of the goddess. As our story is a collective and not personal story, we have to find out where it is typical of our civilization, where some new aspect of the mother goddess of feminine nature has been consciously ignored in Christianity. The most obvious fact which has become a problem in modern times is sexuality. Under the ecclesiastical law of social order, it is said to be dangerous and the cause of much trouble. It destroys marriages and so forth. It should be brought under control by law and be permitted only in marriage. That is the Catholic view, which also says that total abstinence would be better. 
or that sex should be allowed only for the procreation of children and anything else is sinful. But you cannot just decide by sitting around at a table how God or sexuality has to be ruled, which is a tremendous error in the Christian system, resulting in the gods starting to develop autonomous activities. This ruling as to sexual behavior has never been observed. Either people have kept to the law and become neurotic, or they have lived a double life or fallen into sin and regretted it afterward. Monogamy among animals works as long as there is an equal number of males and females. Baboons go about in groups of 20 to 30 and are monogamous as long as the sexes are equal. If by some natural catastrophe the males are reduced, however, then the surplus of females is distributed among the males and it is ignored that females outnumber males. But in our civilization, the law of monogamy rules, and as a result, some women have no sexual life, and many go into convents. They are out of the game. But nobody takes any notice of the natural fact of their biological needs, which has to be faced, and the goddess is ignored. One pretends not to see some natural and vital organic archetypal need, which is right there and wants to function. Rather, laws are laid down and enforced with bad effect. Not only the god's sexuality, if one can use such a term, has been ignored, but also some of the needs of feminine life. It is well known that there is far more trouble over chastity in convents than in monasteries, so that the possibility of giving up the woman's side of the order has been seriously discussed. Apparently women have greater difficulty in this aspect. Men can more easily do some hurt to their nature and are less harmed than women. Military service for women is also a problem, for women seem to digest the regulations imposed on them less well than men. Their nature revolts more. They need to be more natural and less one-sided in their development. It seems to me that here there is a concrete feminine need. A man's elon for spiritual interests can carry him along the way from his body. This difference between men and women is symbolized in mythology by the gods of the sun and moon, the sun being the masculine mind and the moon the feminine. Looked at naively, one can say that the sun is reliable. It rises regularly, whereas the moon is moody. It comes up every evening an hour later and fades and wanes and disappears. In Egypt, the moon is the male god, Mean. It probably has a connection with primitive man, since the moon is so moody and irregular in its behavior. In most civilizations, however, the moon is feminine. In the Western Christian civilization, one could say that the solar principle is exaggeratedly ruling and that the lunar principle is not recognized enough. In our story, it is the godmother, a part of the feminine principle, who has been ignored by the king. So the girl is cursed, either because the goddess is angry or because her feelings are hurt. In one of the many versions, she is not cursed by a goddess, but by a rejected, unpleasant lover. A disagreeable man turns up at the king's court and is refused. In revenge, he curses her and puts her to sleep for a hundred years. He is a magician. Here the dangerous power who curses the girl is a male figure. He would represent, in the context of feminine psychology, an onimus figure. That is, the personification of a negative spirit which is not accepted at the king's court. The rejected lover who curses the girl is a semi-divine figure which touches again on the just so story for nobody can pretend that she should have married him the girl does the right thing in refusing him but all the same the curse falls on her we cannot assume however that this unpleasant lover is the personal animus of the heroine it is much more probably that he represents a mental attitude which has been rejected by the father king the latter represents the collective principles of a civilization, and the unpleasant lover would be all that which has been rejected in the collective. It is sometimes possible that the collective does not represent normality, and then the zeitgeist is ill. Then the right instinctive behavior can come up in an individual against the collective. There are collective neuroses. A whole family may be neurotic, and then a child is born who, by God's blessing, has a healthy disposition and, instead of adapting to the family's neurosis, opposes it. Or there is a psychotic woman. She is married, but according to the Mendelian laws, does not necessarily have a psychotic child. 
she can have a normal child. But the latter is born of a psychotic mother and will be allergic to her and will react negatively to the mother's illness. To hate the mother is a healthy instinctive reaction in this case. That is a genuine tragedy which occurs over and over where the healthy nature collides with the neurotic family attitude. The instinctive right behavior causes undeserved misery. It is the theme of an infinite number of hero motifs. What is pathological hates what is sound, and what is sound is disgusted by and hates what is pathological. Just as animals fight against the sick animal, a normal child born into pathological surroundings will not be able to say that he is right and the others are wrong, for he will have doubts. The others will say he is wrong, that he is the devil, and that is the inevitable tragedy in many young lives. Sometimes, in analysis, it is enough to say, you are right. Why did I doubt it? Just the confirmation suffices. In marriage also, one partner may be neurotic, a mass of repressions, and will always accuse the other. Let us say that one partner has a sexual perversion and wants to force the other to cooperate, but the other refuses. The former will accuse the latter of lack of feeling and love, but the other partner will still be disgusted. Who is neurotic? In such cases, they will always accuse each other, and sometimes it is very difficult to find out where the fault lies. I remember a case where the wife had terrific hysterical symptoms, but only when the husband was around, and was quite normal when she was away from home. In analysis, it was discovered that the man was completely contained in the mother complex. As far as feeling and love and affection were concerned, he had never married. When he was 67 and she 62, he was still writing to his mother whether he should not divorce. They were grandparents, and the husband had not made up his mind yet if he should say yes to his partner. Every time she went home, she got seasick. It was a normal reaction and a good sign that the healthy nature vomited in such surroundings. You can innocently fall into misery, an important truth to remember, especially for those people who tend to be moralistic about the question of neuroses.